Enjoy this sneak peek of a behind the scenes conversation with Dr. Dan McClellan. For the full exclusive, check out patreon.com slash deep drinks. Moving on, I guess, to the, uh, to the 1611 edition of the King James Bible, well, the first King James Bible, uh, what was the state of Christianity, the English speaking state of Christianity at the time, right before the King James was published? So uh, King James uh, came to power in 1603, and it was the Hampton Court Conference the next year where uh, a guy named uh, Reynolds, uh, John Reynolds, I think was his name, uh, proposed a new translation of the Bible as a means of, of trying to unify uh, the church because the church was in a bit of disarray. It had only been, uh, it hadn't even been a hundred years since uh, Henry VIII uh, left the Catholic Church because the Pope would not annul his marriage to, I, I believe, Catherine of Aragon. Uh, and created the the Church of England. And there were attempts to kind of return to Catholicism, and then uh, those attempts were abandoned, and then we had attempts to kind of establish what the Church of England is going to be. And it was kind of midway between Catholicism and a pure Protestantism, but you had people trying to pull it more towards Catholicism. You had people trying to pull it more towards pure Protestantism. The Puritans wanted it be, to be more Protestant. Uh, and then after King James, you had the development of um, the uh, Anglicanism. Uh, and so King James is coming right in the middle of this. And so there are a lot of fractures in the church. And one of the points of the Hampton Court Conference was to try to uh, give the Puritans the sense that their concerns were going to be addressed. Uh, King James had no intention of actually uh, satisfying any of the Puritans' ideas. Um, he actually pulled the church a little more in a Catholic direction. But one of the things that was approved was this idea for a new translation of the Bible. And there had already been translations of the Bible into English that had been in circulation since uh, 1520. Five uh, is Tyndall's translation of the New Testament into English, the first one that was done directly from uh, a Greek source text. And then by 1535, you had Miles Coverdale's uh, translation of the full Bible, which was basically taking what Tyndall had done with the New Testament and a chunk of the uh, Old Testament. And then Coverdale himself translated the rest of the Old Testament from Latin and from German and from other languages because he did not know Hebrew. Um, so 1535 is the full first Bible. Uh, published in English, translated mostly from uh, Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic source texts. Uh, and then we have uh, other Bibles that are being produced. The Geneva Bible is the one preferred by Puritans. Uh, and the Geneva Bible was kind of the foil to King James, and in part because it made a big deal out of the fact that uh, the people of God should have no king except God. So there was a lot of anti-monarchic rhetoric uh, in the way the text was translated in the explanatory notes. And so when King James uh, approves this new Bible, one of the rules that he lays down pretty quickly is that there will be no explanatory notes apart from whatever is absolutely necessary in order to understand the underlying source language. And so this was a way to kind of uh, cut the anti-monarchic tenor out from under the legs of, uh, of the Puritans. And the King James Version is a very conservative revision of a text called the Bishop's Bible, which was originally published in 1568. Uh, and there had been several printings, but they literally took a bunch of copies of, uh, I believe it was the 1608, two or three edition of the Bishop's Bible, sent the copies out to the translators, and they literally just scratched things out and wrote what they wanted to be there in the margins. Uh, and so there were not a ton of changes made. It is very, very faithful to the source text. It didn't really change a ton. The King James Bible is not a significant departure from the tradition that followed it, which I think a lot of people don't understand. A lot of people think things were taken out, things were added in, there were drastic changes made, and that's just not the case. So the King James Version technically is not a translation. It is a very conservative revision of the Bishop's Bible, where they literally took copies of the Bishop Bible, gave them to the translators, and they scratched out the words they didn't like and wrote the words they wanted in the margins. Now, they consulted with source texts, 
uh, so that they knew they were on the right track, but they were not translating from scratch by any stretch of the imagination. Wow, that's that that's actually something that I found like very profound. Uh, so before the fifteen, uh, I forgot the exact date. Sorry, the the first Bible in English um, mm-hmm. did well. Even 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 then, I guess, or even after that, w- did people have Bibles in their homes, or was it mainly like you were taught the Bible from the pulpit and you had to trust what the 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 priest's interpretation or how they were reading it? Like how did how did the average person interact with this text? Well, the average person was never going to be able to afford a Bible because of how much work it was to produce it. Prior to the printing press, it was just obscenely expensive. But they, uh, the church had also, uh, since the Reformation, uh, tried to put a stop to uh, what they called uh, vernacular translations of the Bible. So translations into local languages and English was considered one of these vernaculars. And so, yeah, usually the only time they heard the, uh, the text was during some kind of liturgical reading when it was being read, uh, publicly, uh, in a church or when they were getting, um, passages recited to them by, uh, the clergy, the priesthood. So it was not something that someone sat down in the evening and read right before rolling over and go to bed, going to bed. Yeah, so, so for the first 1500 years or so, did like, well, at least for the English um, speakers, people who didn't speak the original languages or have access to these manuscripts, or even for the majority of people, their theological understanding would be very limited, wouldn't surely? Uh, yeah, it would be it would be limited. A lot more people went into the clergy than today, uh, and you had a lot of people in monasteries. In fact, one of the things that happened under uh, the Church of England is almost immediately uh, Henry VIII went through and shut down all the monasteries uh, and confiscated their lands and their money and things like that. And that ended up putting somewhere around two or three percent of the population out of a job, uh, and and in many cases, displaced from their homes. Uh, and so there were not, uh, yeah, the, the regular person on the street would have a very different understanding that would be primarily informed by the kinds of conversations that they would have with others around them and that they would hear from their clergy. But there were a lot more clergy uh, around. So I think they were a little closer to the source of that kind of discourse than most people are today. Uh, But yeah, they did not usually have direct access unless they had the education to have direct access, which was limited to the elites of society. Mm. Wow. Uh, So you've mentioned that they, you know, it's part of what they use to translate um, the King James. But what are the other, I guess, ancient sources they use to check alongside that. So there was a, uh, a medieval edition of what we refer to as the Masoretic text that they used to uh, consult uh, for the Hebrew Bible, what they referred to as the Old Testament. And the Masoretic text is a version of the Hebrew Bible that was produced by medieval scribes who lived in the Galilee region that we refer to as Masoretes. And they kind of uh, had purview over the way the text looked and the, and the notes that were used. And um, so there was a, an addition of that, a single manuscript of that that they used. But for the Greek New Testament, for centuries, all that you had was the Vulgate, which was a Latin translation uh, executed by Jerome around 400 CE. And one of the things that uh, catalyzed the Reformation was the sudden availability of a Greek edition of the New Testament that was produced by a Dutch humanist scholar named Desiderius Erasmus, who was producing his own um, edition of the Vulgate. And in order to kind of show his work, he decided to um, put the Greek side by side with the Latin. Uh, And at the time, there had been kind of a race to see who could produce a Greek edition of the New Testament. And um, Erasmus went to his library in Switzerland, said, give me all the New Testament manuscripts you got, which amounted to seven. Uh, The earliest one was from the 12th century uh, CE. So a good thousand years after our earliest manuscripts of the New Testament. And he cobbled together 
an edition of the Greek New Testament and published that, and that became wildly popular. We now refer to this as the Textus Receptus, which means the received text. And uh, the second edition of his Textus Receptus is what Martin Luther used to produce his translation into German of the New Testament. Uh, his third edition is what was used by the King James translators. So their uh, revision of the Bishop's Bible's New Testament was compared with the third edition of Erasmus's uh, Textus Receptus. Or wait, no. That's, um, yeah, it was based on the third edition. I'm sorry. Uh, Tyndall used the third edition. The King James translators uh, uh, used an edition that was based on the third edition, which oddly includes something that virtually no um, translations of the Bible include today, uh, known as the, the Johannine comma or the Johannine comma, which is in First uh, John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, where it says, um, there are three that agree in heaven. Uh, the, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one, and there are three that agree in earth, the Spirit, the blood, and the water, and these three agree. Now that uh, Erasmus in his day already knew that that reading probably wasn't original to the text. He can't, uh, it wasn't in his Greek manuscripts. It was in some Latin manuscripts, but some late Latin manuscripts. And he said, I'm not including this unless somebody produces a reliable Greek manuscript that has this reading. And he was getting a lot of pressure from people to include it. And lo and behold, suddenly somebody comes up with one. And so he reluctantly adds it to the third edition of his Textus Receptus, which is the edition that informed uh, the editions that were used by the King James translators. And so that is in the King James version, even though even when it was originally being produced, they knew that wasn't a part of uh, the original text. Whoa. So there are relics of this. Another interesting variant reading, uh, the last half of the last chapter of Revelation, Erasmus didn't have a Greek manuscript. Uh, the manuscripts were cut off right before the end. And so what he did was take the, uh, the Vulgate and back translate into Greek. And then he wrote that in the column for the Greek. And one of the things that was in um, the Vulgate was a misreading of a, uh, the word um, ligno for uh, tree. And he re misread it as libro for book. And so in Revelation, in the King James Version, it talks about people whose names are written in the book of life, which is a misreading. The Greek very clearly says names that are written in the tree of life. Uh, and so there are a handful of uh, variant readings that uh, the King James Version preserves uh, because of problems with the way that uh, Erasmus put together his manuscript. Wow. Um I don't know if this is possible, but if I was to graph out, like visually, I'll probably do this in the editor or something, but could you talk about the, I guess the, I don't even know what the word is, like lineage, I guess, not lineage, but like Jesus, for, for the New Testament, like Jesus mm -hmm. spoke in Aramaic and then that was translated into Koine Greek and then that was translated into um, the, the uh, Vulgate. Latin, mm -hmm. Latin, and then that was used for the Bishop's Bible, and then that was used for the King James. Could you like step that out, or is that not? Yeah, it's, that, it's, it gets a little complex, but I can kind of simplify it. So we we have a tradition regarding um, Jesus preaching in Aramaic. Our very first manuscripts uh, of the New Testament, the original manuscripts, were all written in Greek. There's not really a good case to make that any were written in Aramaic and then translated into Greek. So the language of the New Testament is Greek. Uh, we have the New Testament being translated into Latin, second, third centuries. Uh, that's called the Old Latin. Uh, Jerome, around 400 CE, kind of uh, retranslates and creates what became known as the Vulgate, which was considered the official translation for a long time. Up until around 400 CE, Christians considered the Septuagint, the ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, to be more authoritative than the Hebrew. In fact, you have folks like uh, Origen of Alexandria and others who are accusing Jewish people of having changed the text of the Hebrew Bible to make it sound less Christian, 
Uh, and then with Jerome, you have this shift to what they call the Hebraica Veritas, that we're going to return to trusting the Hebrew, even though his Vulgate is in many ways dependent on the Greek. But after that, you get translations uh, in the following centuries uh, into Syriac, you get translations into Gothic languages, into Ethiopic, uh, into other languages like that you start to get translations into English that aren't really full translations, but kind of interlinears, where you would take a, um, a Latin manuscript and they would write the English translation of each word underneath in a uh, handwritten script uh, in the medieval period. Uh, around the end of the 14th century, we have what's known as the Wycliffe Bible, which was not translated entirely by Wycliffe, but um, was influenced by Wycliffe and the movement that Wycliffe started, but that was translated into English from the Latin. And so it's not until you have the production of Erasmus's Textus Receptus that you begin to see people translating into other languages, vernacular languages, first Luther with German and then Tyndall with English, directly from the Greek uh, edition of the New Testament that had been produced by Erasmus. Uh, and then slowly, with Coverdale, um, Tyndall was able to translate some of the Hebrew Bible from Hebrew. Coverdale didn't know Hebrew, but later translators, you have the Matthew Bible, uh, you have the Geneva Bible, you have the Great Bible, you have uh, the Bishop's Bible. These are going back and consulting the manuscripts in Hebrew and in Greek. However, the tradition that is still somewhat connected to uh, the Vulgate from Coverdale's use of the German and the Latin uh, is still influential. And so there are some ways that the King James Version and the Bibles that came before it uh, rely on some of the traditional readings from the Vulgate. But yeah, once you get to around 1516 with Erasmus's uh, Greek New Testament, suddenly there's an explosion of, of new translations into English that are going back to the original Greek and the original Hebrew and Aramaic. This is one of the things that the Reformation is, is really concerned about. And this is one of the reasons that we have the production of the Apocrypha, because the Vulgate uh, weaves all the Apocryphal texts into the Hebrew Bible. They are not separate texts, but they're parts of these texts, like Daniel is a lot longer in the Vulgate. And you have other um, books that are longer. And what Martin Luther does is notices these aren't in the Hebrew editions of these books. These come from Greek and Latin manuscripts. And so I'm going to separate them out and I'm going to put them in their own little section. And so everything that he was not finding in the Hebrew manuscripts, but were in the Vulgate, he was moving into a separate section, which he called the Apocrypha. And the debate about this resulted in the Catholic Church recognizing those passages as what they call deuterocanon, uh, recognizing that the canon established within the Hebrew manuscript traditions is different from their canon, and so they're going to recognize uh, a tiered kind of uh, canon and deuterocanon. Um, and so Luther separates out the Apocrypha, and Luther actually wanted to get rid of a lot of other books as well, like James, like Hebrews, like Revelation, and none of that really took off. But what did stick was the uh, separation out of the Apocrypha, which was based on this return to the Hebrew manuscripts rather than reliance on the Latin Vulgate. So I have a, um, a version, it's up here somewhere. I got the, the 400 year um, read, like a, a line for line reprint of the original. And uh -huh. something, I no something I noticed in there was um, that they have like, they, 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 le they left the printing mistakes in. Uh, mm -hmm. like the jots or like little ink, you know, mistakes or and, and things. Are there any mistakes in the original, in the, in the first printing? Oh yeah, there are, there are a number of mistakes. And there's a, there's a scholar named David Norton, who's uh, a very famous scholar of the King James Version, who has uh, published a couple of books, a short history of the King James Version, a textual history of the King James Version, where he goes through and, and documents a lot of the, the mistakes. There were reprintings immediately. Like almost every year after 1611, somebody is reprinting uh, the King James Version. And they're correcting mistakes, and sometimes they're introducing new mistakes. And some of those mistakes 
uh, never get removed. Uh, and the 1769 uh, is a, an edition of the King James Version published by a scholar at Oxford named Benjamin Blaney. And that became kind of the standard that became known as the authorized version. Virtually all editions of the King James Version today are based on Blaney's 1769 edition. So it does not match up with the 1611. It has fixed a lot of the printing mistakes, but it has printing mistakes of its own that uh, that it has introduced. We're not to the to the point yet where we can use computers to compare and and check things. So printing mistakes are still an inevitability. I, I grew up in a Protestant church. We didn't have the uh, apoc apocrypha at all. Can you explain what's in there? So the apocrypha is a, a designation, is a, a set of texts uh, that Martin Luther kind of pulled out of the previous versions uh, of the Old Testament, the, the Vulgate. And these were texts that were found in the Greek Septuagint. Uh, you'll recall that for the first few centuries of Christianity, they trusted the Greek Septuagint more than they trusted the Hebrew. Uh, and so the Vulgate is based on the Greek Septuagint in a lot of ways. And so it includes some of the additions to books like Daniel and Esther and some additional books like Maccabees and things like that. These texts were considered authoritative within Hellenistic Judaism, within early Judaism uh, uh, occupied by Greek speaking Jewish people. And so that is the tradition that is enshrined in the Vulgate what becomes authoritative within Judaism, which is separating off from Christianity sometime in the second century CE, is what is found in the Hebrew manuscripts, which does not include things like Maccabees and these additions to Daniel and, and Esther and, and other texts. And so there's a difference in the uh, Jewish Hebrew tradition and the Vulgate, the Christian tradition. Uh, and this gets noticed by Luther when returning to the Hebrew, which is considered authoritative. So um, apocrypha just means hidden. Um, and it is the idea here is that these texts were not a part of the Jewish tradition. They're probably not uh, considered, or they probably shouldn't be uh, considered authoritative. Now, when Martin Luther separated him, them out, that created a third corpus of scripture for Protestants. You had the Old Testament, you had the Apocrypha, and then you had the New Testament. And the Apocrypha is in the 1611 King James Version. It was published by Protestants for centuries. Uh, and it wasn't until the 19th century when you had the British and Foreign Bible Society in the UK and the American Bible Society in the United States that were trying to um, share Bibles and spread them uh, all over the place. The American Bible Society had the goal of putting a Bible in every home in America. And I think the, uh, they managed to place something like 500,000 Bibles in one year. Like they were very aggressive. Um, but one of the things they did to make their printing and their distribution more efficient was they began to produce Bibles that did not include the Apocrypha, that just had the Old Testament and the New Testament. And by the end of the 19th century, this became kind of the de facto authoritative version of the Bible. And so by 1900, Protestants had decided we don't need the Apocrypha anymore. And so uh, it was a part of Protestantism for the majority of the existence of Protestantism and only in the last uh, almost 200 years, has it been something that they considered um, negotiable? Of the earliest manuscripts, what do we have? Like, when's the first complete, I guess, copy of Mark, or how late is that? That's uh, that's pretty late. We can cobble together almost all of Mark based on um, the manuscripts and then the quotations from the patristic authors by about 300 CE. Uh, but we don't get a full copy until we get to what are known as the great unseals. So Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, um, Alexandrinus, and these are mid to late fourth century into the fifth century CE. Uh, but we have, and, and there are some manuscripts that uh, include the majority uh, of these texts. 
So I think we can probably account for pretty much everything by the third century CE, but um, we don't have a single manuscript that contains everything uh, for Mark or Matthew or whatever until probably the fourth century CE. Our earliest manuscript of any kind, of any size, is a little credit card size fragment of, um, I think, 37 words from the book of John that is dated between around 125 CE to maybe 150 CE. So the closest we can get to an, what we call an autograph, the author's actual own text, uh, is maybe 30 to 50 years. Uh, but again, that's a tiny little fragment of 37 words, just a handful of verses. Interesting. Do we, uh, so since the 1611 uh, translation, do we have better or like have new, manu well, so when I say new, have earlier manuscripts <laughs> appeared? Uh, has scholarship uh, changed? Uh, like, do we have better and early manuscripts? Absolutely, we have better manuscripts, uh, particularly in the, the 18th and 19th centuries, there were a number of discoveries that were made of more ancient and more reliable manuscripts, and also manuscripts that we had known about but had been lost or had not been made widely available became available. So Vaticanus is one of those very early important manuscripts of the whole Bible that was uh, limited to people who had access to the Vatican Library, but that was made public, uh, I think, in either the 19th or the, the 20th century. And we discovered a ton more. We discovered Sinaiticus, one of the most important manuscripts uh, in St. Catherine's Monastery on the top of uh, Sinai. Uh, and we continue to discover manuscripts. And so today, I think they put the number of Greek New Testament manuscripts at like 5,800. However, the majority of those, the, the vast majority of those come from like the year 900 or after. So there are many, many centuries after our earliest manuscripts, which are still, uh, are not very numerous. But using computers, using all the manuscripts that we have found, we have been able to reconstruct what we think is a much more faithful version of how the New Testament probably originally looked. And so that tradition that I referred to, the Textus Receptus, originally produced by Erasmus, that informed the translation uh, of the Bible all the way up to the King James Version, which became the most authoritative Bible. In 1881, there was a new edition of the King James Version, not a, a printing, but an actual revision that was published, the, the New Testament at least, uh, that decided to step away from the Textus Receptus tradition and create a new, or, or use a new edition of the New Testament that had been created using all these new manuscripts. Uh, and that was called the Revised Version. And it was controversial, very controversial, because one of the things it did was omit some passages. And so, um, and down to today, if you look at newer translations of the Bible, many of them will be based on our newer reconstruction of the New Testament, what we traditionally call the critical text, that has recognized we have several passages from the Textus Receptus that we now know were not a part of the original New Testament. And so rather than leave them in, Scholars just decided to take them out, but to maintain traditional versification so we don't throw everything off, they just omit the verse. And so on social media all the time, I, I run across people who just are bewildered by the fact that their translation of the Bible has Matthew 17 go from verse 20 to verse 22, and they don't know what's going on with, with verse 21. And this is a passage that we now know was added to the text of Matthew centuries later, based on some scribe uh, writing this passage in the uh, in the margins, and then the next copy they've decided to incorporate the marginal note directly into the um, to the body of the text, and so this kind of throws a lot of people off, and you have a lot of people who very dogmatically adhere to the Textus Receptus and think, no, this is more reliable, this is more original, this is a better manuscript. Uh, and the data don't really support that. So most Bibles today are going to differ, particularly in the New Testament, from what we see in the King James Version. We have more reliable readings, and um, we have much better manuscripts today. What are some of the problematic verses in the King James outside of 
the 16 missing or well, missing verses in the new in the new translations well there there are passages that are um not understood incredibly well and so the the translation is uh is something that we would disagree with now uh and there there are times when it's a it's a mixture of different things so one passage for instance in the in the epistle of jude verse 22 there's only one chapter of jude it says of some have compassion making a difference and this sounds like uh, and jude is talking about we've got these uh these people uh, snuck in who are causing problems for the church and then we have of oh, some have compassion making a difference and today we look at that and we go oh this is telling us uh you know if we have compassion on these people we can make a difference we can have a positive impact a positive influence on their lives, which is a great message, but has absolutely nothing to do with what the King James translators were trying to say. Because the phrase making a difference did not come to refer to having a positive influence until around the year 1900. It's only been within the last century and a bit that people have used that phrase to mean that. Prior to that, making a difference meant making a distinction. And so originally the King James uh, translators wanted to say, have compassion on some people, but be discerning on whom. And so we've wildly misunderstood that because of how much the language has changed. But additionally, that phrase making a difference is translating what's called a participle, a verbal noun. And in the Textus Receptus, that participle is in the nominative case, which means it is something that is connected to the subject of the sentence. We now know, based on the critical text, that the earliest and most reliable manuscripts have that participle in the accusative case. So it's actually not associated with the subject. It is the object of the verb. So whoever is making a difference, making a distinction, they're the ones on whom you're supposed to have compassion, according to the oldest Greek manuscripts. And so most translations today will render something like, have compassion on those who are wavering. Because this make a distinction idea refers to I'm debating, I am trying to figure out, I'm not sure, or I am actually separating. And so you have either have compassion on those who are wavering or have compassion on those who have separated themselves, have compassion on those who doubt. So you have a number of different ways that this is translated today that is a total departure hmm. from how the King James Version uh, has translated it. Uh, there are a number of places where there are questions of the the way the language has evolved that lead to misunderstanding. Um, and there are uh, ways that the overly literal nature of the King James Version has led to just incomprehensible English. And I'm, I'm going to pull up... Um, one example. So 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. I, I have just always found this just impenetrable English. It says, but if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. And you can take as long as you want with that, but you cannot make sense of it in anything remotely approximating a way that is probably original to the Greek. This is overly literal. This is just impenetrable English. And the uh, idea is, is actually um, a newer translation says, if anyone has caused sadness, he's not saddened me alone, but to some extent, not to exaggerate, he has saddened all of you as well makes a lot more sense. Uh, but this is a case where uh, the King James translators, because the Greek was very difficult, kind of defaulted to just translating it very, very literally, rather than um, translating it in a way that was more clear. And this is something translators do. If they don't know what something means, they will frequently translate it very literally and then leave it up to the reader to try to discern what on earth uh, is intended. Um, so you see that a lot in the King James Version as well. It's overly literal because it doesn't know what it means, and that doesn't help us at all. We have no way of, of um, figuring out what it means. And, and 2 Corinthians, I think, is, is infamous in the King James Version for having a lot of that impenetrable language.